So yeah. So um, we'll get things rolling here. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. First of all, it's my first webinar with Ontario Nature. Um, and yeah, and it's on Northern Ontario nature-based tourism. So before we begin, I'll do a land acknowledgement. Um, we'll go over, uh, well, Melina just went over the webinar housekeeping. Um, and then we'll do a quick poll of the audience to see what folks are, uh, are interested in. Um, so to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land I'm speaking on today, um, which is Ontario Nature's Thunder Bay office. Uh, it resides on land that is the territory of Anishinaabeg people, uh, notably Fort William First Nation, who are our neighbors to the south, but also many other communities, um, and who have lived and cared on or cared for these lands uh, for generations and to this day. Uh, the land that I'm on is subject to the Robinson Superior Treaty of, of 1850, which opened the North Shore of Lake Superior for settlement and resource extraction in exchange for recognition of hunting and fishing rights, an annuity payment, and the expansion of the reserve systems that many Indigenous people live on today. Um, when I was growing up, um, Indigenous people's treaties, uh, it wasn't really talked about much in school. Um, so when I moved to Thunder Bay in 2015, uh, my eyes were open to the vibrant communities uh, that are you know, still existing today and, uh, and thriving in some places. Uh, I was also exposed to ongoing effects of colonialism and racism that is still very present in our society today. Uh, land acknowledgements are a small step on the path to reconciliation between settlers of Canada and Indigenous people. Um, and I'm very grateful to share these lands, um, but I know that there's also much more work to be done uh, to create an equitable country that fulfills its promises to diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people across uh, Turtle Island. So during this event, I ask that we um, we reflect on the land that we are currently residing on, um, and while outside, um, treat the land with respect, leave it better than you found it, um, and consider our shared duty to protect and care for one another. Um, all right, uh, so on to the webinar housekeeping. Uh, Melina mentioned the chat function and all that. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end that we'll also use the chat function for. Uh, so if you have any pressing questions, I'll ask that you try and uh, uh, at least questions about the content. Um, keep it till the end and hopefully I can answer some things for you. And... I suppose we'll move into the poll of the audience. Um, so Melina, if you want to put that on there. Um, so if the poll is covering your, um, your screen, there is a slide that has uh, numbered like districts that we're asking um, people about. I'm just curious if people have ever visited Northern Ontario before. Um, and if so, where did you go? Obviously, there's a lot of places, so I just kind of made it very broad. Um, so I'll give people a, a minute here. As things are coming in, I see a lot of people um, have visited Thunder Bay District, uh, lots from Sudbury, or lots visiting Sudbury District. Um, this is fun, a fun feature. And it seems like as far as activities are going right now, hiking and day trips, as well as uh, canoe or recreational kayak paddling seem to be in the lead. Uh, to the people who have never been up north before, I hope that you can come visit us sometime. It's a beautiful part of the province. All right. Mm -hmm. Give it another couple seconds here. Had 88 responses, 90 responses. All right, well, it seems like we've got some fairly well-traveled folks watching today. Uh -huh. All right, I'll end it there, just at 75% of people. 
Um, all right, yeah, so Thunder Bay District and Sudbury D District were the uh, most visited spots, both lovely places. Uh, as you'll hear in a second, I'm currently residing in the Thunder Bay District. Can I share these results with people? There we go. Um, yeah, so feel free to take a peek at those. Seven people never been up north. I hope you learned something. All right. Awesome. Exit that. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, Melina introduced me, um, but I am Jake Guggenheimer. I am Ontario Nature's uh, nature-based tourism coordinator. Um, and yeah, I was born and raised in Innisville, Ontario, which is just south of Barrie. Um, my family still lives down there, so I do visit from time to time. Um, I moved to Thunder Bay, oh gosh, seven years in 2015. Um, when I came up here to do some schooling at Lakehead University for their outdoor recreation, parks and tourism program. Uh, and once I graduated that, as, as so many folks are, um, I was feeling like I needed to do a little more schooling just to get more well-rounded. So I did the forestry technician program at Confederation College um, to kind of see, I, I figured I might as well see both sides of, um, of how we treat our land in the province, you know, from an industry perspective, as well as from a, a more conservation uh, focus. Um, and yeah, I've worked a handful of jobs um, over the past couple of years of living up here. Um, for the folks who have been up in Northern Ontario, you may have seen me at provincial parks. I've worked at uh, several of them along the North shore of Lake Superior. Uh, notably Rainbow Falls, Nays, and White Lake Provincial Park. Um, and yeah, and I've also worked for Ontario Nature uh, a few times in the past, just running nature programs. Um, and currently I am with them again, and I'm super pleased to be here. So that's my, my history and my experience of, of up here so far. Um, and I'll touch on our Thunder Bay office because I feel like some people don't know it exists because we're so far removed from our main office based in Toronto. Um, so yeah, the Boreal office has been around for I believe over 15 years. It's quite small. Uh, we only have about four people in it right here and that's that's the most office staff it's had in, in years. Um, but yeah, we do a lot of work on sustainable forestry practices, um, kind of providing oversight on people, uh, on, sorry, not people, but people and the industry as a whole uh, in the regions up here. Um, we also like to focus on protecting woodland caribou um, as they're a, a species at risk, um, as well as other species at risk up in uh, our unique Northern setting. Um, we try and do lots of community outreach and educational events, like going to public festivals, setting up uh, just information booths around, as well as running our own guided hikes for, for communities in uh, northwestern Ontario. Um, so yeah, without further ado, you might be wondering how you get to northern Ontario. There's a few different ways. Um, so you can do it by road. Um, I, kind, I made the assumption that a lot of people would be coming from Southern Ontario. I used Toronto as, as a general um, like base, but if you are coming from uh, the East, like somewhere near Ottawa or uh, more of like the, the Golden Horseshoe or Southwestern Ontario, um, you know, these, these timelines and kilometers might uh, be a little bit different for you. But yeah, so from general, general Southern Ontario, I think um, if you drive north to Sudbury and then take Highway 17 along the shores of Lake Huron and Superior, it is the most beautiful drive that this province has to offer. 
um, once you get past Sault Ste. Marie, you're literally driving through these big rolling mountains and just you have beautiful vistas of Lake Superior um, and just vast swaths of, of forest. Uh, if you want to, if you are coming from, you know, Sarnia, uh, somewhere in the southwest, um, you can board the MS Chichimon, which is a ferry from Tobramori uh, that crosses Lake Huron. Or if you want to take a northern route, you can follow Highway 11 that cuts through classic boreal landscapes um, of black and white spruce, tamarack, and aspen. Um, from Toronto to Thunder Bay, it takes about 14 to 16 hours. Um, that's, I'm sure you all know the lovely uh, season of construction that we're in right now. Um, and often on the Trans-Canada Highway, there is lots of it. So be prepared for delays. Um, so yeah, these are just some, some Google Maps snippets showing you like how far the kilometerage and the timelines that you could expect. Um, so that is the 17, Highway 17 route that I was talking about. And particularly, if you can see my mouse following along this shoreline, it's gorgeous, as well as on the north shore of Lake Superior, um, up by Marathon and Terrace Bay. And if you take Highway 11, it's just a little bit further. Um, and a bit of a detour. This would be probably faster for you if you were headed over to Thunder Bay from Ottawa, um, but it's it's not too much. And usually I do the drive in, in one or two days because I'm going for a vacation, but if you're looking to travel, you, you don't have to drive 15 hours in a day. You can do a few, stay somewhere, enjoy the sights. Uh, the drive is truly beautiful and um, really allows you to experience the land. Um, if that's not your thing, if you don't want to be stuck in a car for hours uh, at a time, you might want to fly. Um, so flights are available um, to Thunder Bay and Sault Ste. Marie from uh, the airports in Toronto um, with connecting flights to Ottawa as well as um, other airports in Southern Ontario, some of the smaller regional ones. Um, yeah, so we get service from uh, WestJet, Air Canada, and Porter Airlines. Um, if that's your preferred method to come up north, make sure you've rented a vehicle in Thunder Bay or uh, wherever you're going uh, to get around. Things are pretty spread out up in this part of the woods. Um, so yeah, you're going to want to make sure to still do a bit of driving. Um, but yeah, base camping out of Thunder Bay, uh, doing a series of short overnight or day trips um, is very possible. There are lots of uh, amazing opportunities that we'll get into shortly. Um, so yeah, this is the approximate flight path uh, from Toronto to Thunder Bay. It's only a two hour flight. Um, generally, that's on smaller planes with rows uh, four across. Um, yeah, you pass over Georgian Bay or Lake Huron. Um, if you're lucky, you get to see the rolling hills and wind farms in Sault Ste. Marie. And occasionally, I haven't been this lucky, but once you fly up close to Thunder Bay, planes will occasionally go over Sleeping Giant Provincial Park, where you can see uh, the largest cliffs in the province. Um, but it, it depends on the weather and, and their flight plan. All right. So what to do while you visit. Um, I feel like this is the real meat and potatoes of, of this webinar. Uh, so hopefully people enjoy. Now, I will say, disclaimer, there is a lot of stuff to do up here. So I had to kind of pick and choose um, from what I've read online and also from my own personal experiences. Um, so this is not the end all be all of stuff to do while you're in Northern Ontario. Um, hiking was a popular one in the poll. So I have quite a few slides of that. Um, I just mentioned Sleeping Giant Provincial Park, uh, which is 
positively gorgeous. It's only an hour's drive from Thunder Bay, so I'm often caught there. Uh, I try and do a weekend backpacking trip every year. Um, but it also has numerous trails that are uh, great for day tripping. Uh, the sea lion, which is pictured on the bottom photo there, uh, is only like a 20 minute walk in from the trailhead. And it's this like super unique, gorgeous sea arch. Um, and there's a bunch of interpretive signage on how it was made. And, um, and yeah, there's also the head trail, which is quite difficult. It's quite steep. Uh, you're essentially climbing up a, a mountain uh, at parts. But if you have the, uh, the energy and the motivation, you get some stunning views of Thunder Bay and the, uh, the cliff faces. This is me sitting on what looks to be the edge of a cliff, but it's, there are uh, terraces there. So it's not nearly as dangerous as I make it out to be here. Good rule of thumb is to stay away from cliff edges though, I will say. Um, and the chest and knees, which aren't pictured in this slide, um, are also excellent views. There's this really iconic photo that gets used a lot in Northern Ontario tourism. And that is, it's this big, great chasm, um, essentially. And that's the chest, no, sorry, that's the knees um, of Sleeping Giant. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sleeping Giant is a giant geologic formation as well. Um, which is several kilometers long um, and it's in Sleeping Giant Provincial Park. You can see it from uh, Thunder Bay, which if you can see my mouse is across the bay in the top photo, just as tiny little white specks. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a wonderful spot. Um, one of my other favorite hiking spots is Nays Provincial Park. Um, they have a variety of different trail difficulties. Um, so the Pick Island Overlook Trail is the top photo there. Um, and it is the, uh, it is the supposed site of Lauren Harris, where he painted, um, uh, not photos, pictures of Pick Island and other imagery. Uh, notably, um, he inspired parts of uh, the Group of Seven, and yeah, there's a whole bunch of lookouts that are inspired by the group of seven along the North Shore of Superior. So they have vistas and little interpretive signs all over the place if you're driving along the highway. Uh, at the top of this hike, there's also a nice little gazebo uh, to sit down and have lunch at. It's about a two hour hike up to the top of this uh, very large hill. However, it is on like a wide, um, an abandoned access road. So it's, um, you know, it's slow but steady uh, work. Uh, the photo below is the lookout trail at Nays, which is a lot more rocky and a little more, um, you know, a little more black diamond at times. Uh, it's a lot shorter. It only takes about an hour to do, but you get to walk through some cool dune ecosystems and you get a pretty decent view of the forest um, and the view of Lake Superior. Uh, notably, the Dune Trail is probably the easiest one they have at Nays. Um, it's about, I think, two kilometers maybe, and it has a self-guided interpretation um, booklet that you can take and different stops to visit. Uh, if you ever do get the chance to go to Nays Provincial Park, um, it's absolutely gorgeous. It has a two kilometer long sand beach, like right on Lake Superior. So uh, sometimes it can be as still as glass and other times it can be giant rolling waves. Uh, it really depends on the day, but it's, it's gorgeous either way. Uh, they also have an excellent visitor center. Uh, for those of you who may not know, it was a prisoner of war camp. Uh, it was located on that site during World War II for German Air Force and Navy officers. And they have a bunch of interpretation around that and like a, a model replica of the prisoner of war camp, um, as well as plants and animals and different geological features that are in the area. Um, and all that can be found in the visitor center at the park. 
So whether you're camping there or just driving by, I think it's definitely well worth the, uh, the time to stop in. Um, some more uh, hiking. I think we're scaling up in difficulty here. Uh, Mazukama Falls is also along the North Shore of Superior. Um, it's a, a moderate to difficult hike. There are some steep spots, but there are like ropes uh, to assist people. Um, but it's definitely a, a hard journey. Um, in the spring, it's absolutely uh, just just gushing with water. Um, the photo on the left is in the fall, a few years back, and there's also um, it's also accessible in the winter. Um, they actually have an ice climbing festival there uh, with like hooks and picks and everything to climb up this uh, giant wall of ice. Uh, so if that's something you're into, you can definitely make it up here in the winter as well. Uh, the Caskiel Trail is 55 kilometers of trail divided up into multiple segments that run along the rugged shores of Lake Superior. Um, it takes anywhere from three to five days to do the whole trail, depending on uh, your speed and the size of your party. But uh, what's nice about that is you can also just do it in segments. Um, I believe they have a website, or if you just search online uh, the Caskiel Trail, you'll find their, their guidebook, and it has trails and vistas to look out for. Um, but yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, and it ranges anywhere from, you know, some pretty black diamond advanced hiking to more relaxed uh, casual hikes. Um, all right. So these next two are uh, more accessible in that they are uh, relatively close to uh, larger cities. Um, as well as they have nice wide trails and not a lot of elevation gain. Um, so Kakabeka Falls um, is an awesome waterfall to visit. The provincial park is located just a short 20 minute drive from Thunder Bay. Um, and it is a must see if you're passing close by. It's known as the Niagara of the North. Um, and they have viewing boardwalks uh, on both sides to check out the mist and, uh, and look into the falls. There's also a small visitor center and park store there, um, as well as a campground with other hiking trails if you're interested. Um, but yeah, it's a lovely little town or a lovely little park that's located near the uh, cute town of Kakabeka Falls as well. Uh, so definitely check those out if you're on the road. Um, we Met Canyon is another provincial park up here. Um, it is a short detour off of Highway 1117, which is between Nipigon and Thunder Bay. It offers a wheelchair accessible ramp uh, down to a wide gravel path um, that you can finish on your, your journey. Uh, the trail is, I believe, around two kilometers, but it finishes at these, uh, they're called viewing pods. And yeah, they it's essentially just a big deck that juts off the edge of these um, giant cliffs to give you a full panoramic view of the canyon. Uh, so if you're wary of heights, I might recommend staying a bit farther back from the edge because um, there are railings and interpretive signs there, but you are at some points on the deck standing and looking down a hundred meter drop. Um, and in the base of the canyon, there's uh, lots of unique stuff going on. Um, such as plants that are normally found in the Arctic because it's so cold at the bottom of the canyon. Um, and there could be peregrine falcons nesting on the cliff sides if you're lucky enough to see them. So yeah, it's a wonderful spot to check out. Uh, I will say that there's no camping at We Met Canyon and it's a day use park only. So don't, uh, don't show up looking to set up a tent or anything. Um, so yeah, we'll switch into paddling for a second. Um, and for those of you who like to paddle, you're in luck. Uh, there's countless lakes and rivers to hop into your boat on and travel around. 
uh, Lake Superior, which is the largest freshwater lake in the world, at least by surface area, um, offers excellent opportunities to explore. Uh, just keep in mind, uh, conditions can change quickly, so make sure you're wearing uh, the appropriate gear, that you have life jackets and possibly wetsuits if you need, um, and that you're a strong paddler. Even in August, uh, the water can still be really cold. Um, so yeah, Quetico Provincial Park is honestly some of the best paddling uh, for canoe routes that I can think of in the province. Um, there are beautiful cliff sides, rivers, lakes. Um, there's a bit of white water in some of the spots as well. Um, but if that's not your thing, you can portage around them as well. Um, and pictographs can even be found in some parts of the park, uh, as well as many other cultural artifacts and relics from uh, the logging days. Um, in a similar fashion, uh, Wabakimi Provincial Park is even more remote. Um, you have to take a float plane or ride a train, or uh, you could, I suppose, paddle into the park. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very remote. It's near the town of Armstrong. Um, and yeah, I would also like to give a shout out to the, uh, the Wabakimi Wilderness Lodge and the Friends of Wabakimi. Um, they uh, helped organize and take care of some of our staff who were doing field work this past spring, um, doing birding research and uh, yeah, they were just so kind and they uh, are truly just wonderful people who uh, care for the park more than more than most. Um, and yeah, I have a little quote here about Lake Superior as well, because it's uh, it truly is the a star, a, a shining sapphire gem of of the northern landscape. Um, so yeah, for those who have never seen Superior, uh, for, ooh, pardon me, those who have never seen Superior get an inadequate, even inaccurate idea by hearing it spoken of as a lake. And to those who have sailed over its vast extent, the word sounds ludicrous. Though its waters are fresh and crystal, Superior is a sea. Uh, that was the Reverend George Grant in 1872. Um, and yeah, so if you if you haven't seen Lake Superior before, it's it takes your breath away. It's just endless water in pretty much every direction that you look. Um, so if you are driving, like, please, I, I can't encourage you enough to go to those lookouts on the side of the highway um, and just get just get washed over by by the awe. Um, I'll talk about a couple of paddling outfitters and guides in the area. Um, so first off, Naturally Superior Adventures in Wawa. Um, they offer a wide variety of different um, water adventures. They do sea kayaking, uh, canoe trips, stand-up paddleboard rentals, and they do anything from uh, like half day trips, full day trips to multi day expeditions. Um, and yeah, they also have the lovely Rock Island Lodge, which acts as a B and B, and it is right on the shore of Lake Superior. I've stayed there in the past, and it's it's very lovely. The hosts and owners of the business are great folks. Um, next, such a nice day adventures, uh, or sand. Uh, as they're known around here, are based out of the uh, North Shore town of Rossport. Um, and they do similar stuff, uh, mostly with a focus on um, sea kayaking, but they offer multiple day trips, like expeditions, um, as well as starter courses to Lake Superior. Um, so if you're new to sea kayaking, uh, I would suggest doing one of those. It's a a two-day course, um, and you're in the lovely sheltered islands of Rossport, so it's a great spot to really build up those skills and then uh, go have some fun on the water. And as I said, the Wabakimi Wilderness Lodge is up in Armstrong. Um, it's a great spot to either just go visit and paddle around or use as a 
a launching spot for either guided or self-guided uh, expeditions into Wabakimi. Um, yeah. Um, there is at least one opportunity for sailing that I know of. That's your thing. Um, a sail superior is a company based in Thunder Bay. Uh, they offer a variety of day trips or overnight trips. Um, it's one of the best ways to experience the big lake, uh, as you can get around quite quickly and see a bunch of stuff all at once. Um, they also are, offer harbor tours in Thunder Bay, um, and they have their, their boats shored up right at the marina downtown. Uh, so if you do make it to the city, uh, they usually have their signs up and you can follow those to uh, drop in or you can book something on their website. Uh, they also offer wine and cheese packages. Uh, so if you want to have a fun evening out on the on the lake, that might be an option for you. Um, I'm not sure how many adrenaline junkies we have in the webinar today, but I thought I'd briefly mention uh, rock climbing and mountain biking. Um, Around Thunder Bay, there are excellent climbing routes uh, from beginner to expert. Uh, Outdoor Skills and Thrills is a local business that loves getting people outside um, and experiencing uh, the rock face. They offer beginner courses um, as well as just general guided hikes of the area if you're not looking to climb up a mountain. Um, but yeah, so they're they're an awesome company. They've been in town for a long time and they they've actually published a, a book on all the different climbing routes in the area. So yeah, they're, they're local experts for sure. Uh, mountain biking opportunities um, exist up here as well. Thunder Bay has an awesome community with a uh, focus on the Trowbridge forest that is home to 29 different trails of varying difficulty. Um, we have a bunch of different local bike shops, as well as the Black Sheep Mountain uh, Bike Club, which occasionally hosts events. Um, sorry. Uh, and in Sault Ste. Marie, the Hiawatha Highlands offer uh, 40 kilometers of trails, um, also of varying difficulty. Um, they also have a lovely mountain biking community. Um, and I will say, if you are bringing bikes along uh, on your travels, to just uh, double check if you are in like a provincial park or something uh, where bikes are allowed to be used on trails. Because um, usually, unless it's otherwise stated, uh, mountain bikes are not allowed on uh, hiking trails in Ontario and uh, national parks. Uh, so yeah, it's always best to ask so you don't accidentally run someone over. Um, all right, and I've kind of talked about them a bit so far, but there's a, a few different accommodation options. Um, you could base camp in Thunder Bay, uh, which might be best if folks are flying in. Um, you know, you'll be close to great amenities and resources. You get to experience culture and food in Thunder Bay. There's quite the, the foodie scene as well as craft beers up here. Uh, I think we have one, two, three, three or four local breweries in town. Um, so it's a, it's a great place to be if that's your thing. Um, and yeah, uh, Thunder Bay also has many cultural events throughout the year and especially in the summer. Um, yeah, if you do plan to base camp in Thunder Bay, uh, if you do fly in, just make sure to rent a, rent a car to travel. The public transit here is not the best. And if you do want to get outside um, to experience some more uh, natural settings, it is a short drive to lots of opportunities, but it's still a drive. Um, but yeah, you could go out for a couple hours, you know, hike a, hike a good mountain and then be back in time to enjoy dinner on a patio somewhere. Um, if you're road tripping, uh, Personally, I think that might be the way to do it, but to each their own, uh, just because you get to experience more of the land that way. Um, it also allows you to, you know, bring your own larger gear like kayaks or canoes, if that's what you want to do along the way. 
Um, but yeah, uh, you can stay at motels or campgrounds along the way. They're pretty frequent throughout the uh, main travel corridors. Um, if it is peak season, you'll want to make sure to reserve a site as sometimes they do fill up, but um, yeah, just make sure, make sure you have a plan before you travel. That's just a general rule of thumb to follow. Um, and yeah, there's lots of lodges and cabins uh, in the area as well. Uh, aside from the the B and B and uh, Wabakimi Wilderness Lodge that I've mentioned, um, a nice spot is uh, beyond the giant nature reserves. It's uh, about an hour from Thunder Bay um, and offers, you know, some more amenities and a, a taste of uh, rustic cabining uh, very close to Sleeping Giant. Um, so let's talk wildlife for a little bit uh, because there's plenty of it up here. Let me tell you that much. Um, and yeah. Um, so yeah, there's many opportunities uh, to view wildlife. Um, it's kind of fun that Ontario, uh, Northern Ontario has all four native species of the deer family um, in the province, uh, which include moose and deer. I'm sure those we know, but there's also uh, caribou as well as a small population of elk that were uh, once reintroduced over near Kenora. Um, yeah, elk used to be more prevalent in the province until they were extirpated, uh, I believe in the 1800s, but there have been efforts to reintroduce them here and near Bancroft in Southern Ontario as well, Southern Ontario. <laughs> um, yeah, if you're driving at dusk or at night, please, uh, be careful because there are lots of moose up in these these regions um, and they can just run out on the road or you know if you take a corner you know sometimes they'll just be standing in the middle of the road uh, so play it safe and and yeah um, if you're lucky enough to see them during the day and not crash um, there can often be small traffic jams of people who want to uh, view them uh, similar to what happens in Algonquin Park, but it's uh, it's a good experience to see like a a mama moose and her two uh, two calves. And there's plenty of other wildlife as well. There's smaller animals like red foxes or porcupines. Uh, you might see skunks, but hopefully from a distance, um, as well as chipmunks and squirrels, that sort of stuff. Um, and while it is awesome to see wildlife uh, while you're camping, it's always best to uh, do only that, just to see them uh, from a distance. Yeah, I want to remind folks not to approach any animals, um, try not to feed them, otherwise they might get dependent on humans for food or get a little too comfortable and start breaking into to tents and looking for food. Um, yeah. We don't want to habituate any animals to our presence. Ideally, they will remain wild animals. Um, I hope we have some birders in the audience today um, because Thunder Bay isn't, can isn't only Canada's gateway to the West, it's also a major flyway for many migratory birds who come to the boreal forest. Um, so every spring and fall are great times uh, to see lots of birds. Uh, so birders come on up. There's hundreds of species of birds that travel north to the boreal and beyond uh, to breed for the summer season. Um, the Dorian Bird Birding Festival uh, is a lovely event. Um, this past year it was a one-day event, but I think it's been a full weekend in past years. Uh, it happens at the end of May and it's thrown by the local conservation authority. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a bunch of birders who get together and there's ex local experts on birds and guided hikes, um, right in the, the prime, uh, migration season. I think we saw, I think we saw over 150 different species on the one day that we were out there this year. Um, but yeah, it was, it was an excellent experience. Um, 
you know, experts and recreational birders alike who just love to share their stories and, and laughs with people. Um, if you do uh, like birding, there's also um, the Thunder Cape Bird Observatory, which is located out at Sleeping Giant Provincial Park. Um, it's at the very end of a peninsula. It's about a 15 kilometer uh, hike out there. So you'd want, you'd probably want to uh, camp there for the night if you wanted to visit. Um, but yeah, they do great work banding birds uh, for research um, as the bird, birds are using the peninsula as a staging ground. Um, and if you visit them during the migration season, uh, they're usually more than happy to talk to you about what they're doing and, and how it helps science and all that. Um, and you get to you know view the birds up close and personally. Uh, in the morning would be for, um, you know, birds, uh, just normal songbirds and stuff like that. But they also do um, try and capture owls in the evening. Uh, so whenever you get there, it's a, a great opportunity. They also look for volunteers. So if you are a super keen birder who wants to live remotely for about two months in a, in a nice cabin on, on the shores of Lake Superior, you might want to look up the Thunder Cape Bird Observatory. But, uh, but yeah, it's not for everyone, but could be an awesome opportunity. Um, we'll talk a little bit about fishing uh, because it is a huge part of the culture up here in Northern Ontario. I know it's not for everyone, but, um, but yeah, chances are you'll run into someone with a, a fishing rod uh, at some point if you come visit. Um, if you're looking to do some fishing yourself, you'll want to make sure that uh, you have your fishing license and outdoors card um, with you. It's, uh, it is the law. There are a few weekends uh, where there are free fishing. I think Father's Day is one of them, as well as um, a few different times. But all that can be found in the 2022 Fishing uh, Ontario regulations, which is the image on the screen there. Um, yeah, it has pretty much all the, a summary of the rules and regulations for the season, uh, including, uh, catch limits and all that. Um, so yeah, you can pick those up pretty much anywhere, uh, Service Ontario's, uh, Canadian Tires, Sporting Goods Stores, um, they should have them in stock. There's also a digital copy online. Um, and something else I found while researching this webinar was Fish Online, which is just a, a cool resource. Um, it's an online interactive map that shows you where fish species um, are. You can sort by species or by lake or uh, by district. Um, there's a whole bunch of different criteria, but yeah, it's great. So if you have the time to, uh, you know, plan out a little bit of a fishing trip. That's definitely an option. Um, and there's a few different opportunities for fishing up here. Um, Lake Superior uh, is an amazing spot for sport fishing as it has such a wide array of fish. Um, Bowman Island Lodge is another lodge that, uh, that offers uh, accommodations. It is only boat out and you would have to contact them uh, if you wanted to, but they focus on lake trout and uh, coastal brook trout in Lake Superior, and they have a focus on catch and release. Uh, they just appreciate the, the fish and the beauty of the landscape mostly. Um, White Lake Provincial Park is also um, good fishing for walleye. Uh, it's about 20 minutes east of White River. Um, and yeah, you'll you'll tell it's White Lake because their their park entrance sign is just a giant walleye jumping out of a lake. Um, and yeah, west of Thunder Bay near Kenora and Dryden, um, there's excellent musky and pike fishing if you're up for more of a challenge. Um, yeah, Lake of the Woods uh, near Kenora and Eagle Lake uh, near Dryden are world renowned for their fishing that draw folks from all over. Um, yeah. Okay, we're going to talk about black bears for a little bit, because if you're up and around northern Ontario, there's a, 
decent chance you may encounter a black bear. Um, and technically, we have two species of bears in Ontario. Um, one is black bears, and the other are the southernmost population of polar bears. But you'll only run into the polar bears if you're going way up to the coast of uh, Hudson or James Bay, so probably not going to be an issue. <laughs> Um, everywhere else, you're just going to have a chance of running across black bears. Uh, but they're just beautiful, intelligent creatures, um, and I have just a huge respect for them. Uh, so it's important to practice some precautions to minimize any negative encounters that could occur. Um, you want to keep your campsite clean of food and smelly objects like deodorant or toothpaste, um, and that's including pet food. Uh, so you want to make sure everything is inside of a rigid trailer or vehicle if it's not actively being used or prepared. Um, a few years back at one of the parks, um, we had a bear break into a couple of tents and a soft tent trailer uh, because there was lots of food all over the place um, and just people not being super responsible with them. Um, but yeah, it's not good because uh, once they start to rely on humans, it can cause uh, you know, negative interactions like that. You know, people have destroyed property. Hopefully you don't have to be face to face with a bear trying to break into your tent to get your Cheetos. Um, but yeah, so we want to try to avoid negative encounters like that at all costs. Um, but yeah, you should know the signs of bear activity, such as um, what bear poop looks like if you run across some scat on the trail or flipped overturned rocks um, can sometimes be a sign of black bears. They're looking for insects. Um, but yeah, you also wanna travel in groups of two or more if you can um, and keep your pets on leashes. Uh, you know, you don't want a loose dog running up to a bear thinking it's, it's all tough and uh, you know, something goes wrong. Um, so yeah, keep your dogs on leashes if you're out in the woods somewhere. It's just good practice. And yeah, make sure if you are with other people to just, if you're chatting, that's good. You're kind of announcing your presence to any bears because uh, chances are they're going to hear you and run off before uh, you'll even know that they're there. Um, but on the off chance you do, uh, you know, you do come across a bear, um, it's always good to have some different prevention tools like whistles or air horns if you come across them. Um, if you are alone and you don't have anyone to talk to, you could sing or whistle or hum, or you could attach a bear bell to yourself uh, just to let them know, you know you're in the forest. Um, yeah, if you do want um, another preventative method uh, or measure, you can carry bear spray. Uh, I want to caution, um, you know, just make sure you know how to properly and effectively use bear spray if you carry it. You want to make sure the wind direction isn't going to blow it back into your eyes. And it's really only effective at like a two meter distance. So um, two meters or closer. So I saw a funny, a funny image from, I think it was the United States National Park Service. And it was just a reminder that bear spray does not work like bug spray. You don't want it on your skin or eyes. It's essentially um, capsaicin, which is like hot, hot pepper oil. Um, so yeah, you want to be very careful with that if that's what you choose to bring with you. Um, and I hope this goes without saying but please, please don't approach any bears that, that you see. Um, if you see a bear on a path uh, and it hasn't seen you, you should, you know, just back away slowly. Um, you know, it might not be the day to finish your hike, uh, but that's okay. Um, if you do come across a bear and it does see you and it's distressing or it's expressing signs of stress like uh, huffing or swatting at the ground um, you want to firmly announce yourself you know uh, don't scream or yell or anything but just say whoa bear hey bear um, and you know you want to make yourself look big either hands up in the air if you have a backpack you can hold it over your head and just walk away backwards um, yeah
Uh, that's about that. Um, bears are lovely creatures that, with a few simple rules, they can uh, remain a fun, a fun sighting and uh, a good, a good story to tell on future trips. Um, so we're coming up to the end of the webinar here. I've just got a few things left. Um, so what to know and bring with you. Um, many of the natural areas in Northern Ontario are quite remote. Um, so access to services can also be limited or non-existent. Uh, for example, cell phone uh, services should be fairly reliable in towns along uh, like highways and travel corridors, but uh, many locations like at campgrounds or hiking trails uh, or just driving along the highway, uh, there's just no cell service. Um, and the same goes for internet connections, although many restaurants and some accommodations do offer uh, some form of Wi-Fi. Uh, I just wouldn't plan on doing any webinars or business meetings from a canoe or at the top of a mountain. It just might not work. Um, but yeah, remoteness also means that emergency services can be far away from where you are. Uh, so if you are going into the backcountry, uh, make sure to bring an emergency device uh, like a spot in case something does happen. Um, Alternatively, it's it's also a good practice to share a travel plan or itinerary with, uh, you know, friends or family who are back home. Um, or if you're visiting like a park or something, you can give it to park staff just to, uh, you know, you can check in with them, say, hey, I'm going, uh, I'm going into the backcountry for this amount of time is my plan. And I will uh, check back in uh, once I'm safe. Uh, yeah, so you just want to share that with people you trust, because it's always better to be safe than sorry. Um, as far as supplies go, um, you want to bring everything you would need for travel. Um, you know, that obviously ranges for people. Uh, so you want to bring your food and, you know, travel supplies, whatever, whatever you need. Um, I know it's summertime right now, but even during hot days, temperatures can drop at nighttime. And, you know, things can get a bit chilly, especially if you're near a large body of water like Lake Superior. Um, the photo on the screen is, uh, I think it's the, the same piece of rock that I was sitting on earlier in the webinar, um, except this was taken on October 16th, uh, a few years back when I did one of my hikes around with some friends. Uh, we you know, it was fall, it was kind of raining the day before, but when we woke up, there was a good couple centimeters of snow on the ground. Um, so yeah, it, it gets cold up here pretty quick. So you want to be prepared if you're coming in the fall. Um, yeah, if you do plan on doing any hiking, which you absolutely should if you can, um, just with all the beautiful vistas and lookouts, you want to make sure that you have a sturdy pair of hiking shoes or boots. Uh, you shouldn't climb mountains in Crocs. It's just not a good idea. As, as fashionable as they are, you don't want to uh, slip down any rocks in them. Um, and also, I want to stress that you should, you should get hiking boots and wear them before you have to do any actual hiking in them to break them in. Otherwise, you could end up with some pretty wicked blisters, and that just really detracts from any fun that you'll be having on your trip. Um, so lucky for you folks, bug season is starting to come to an end. Um, it's still not great up here, but anytime between mid-May and August, there's a good chance that you'll be swarmed by mosquitoes and black flies. So if you think you won't be able to handle that, make sure you get some bug spray or a bug jacket. Um, on, to on the topic of jackets as well, the weather can change, like I, like I said, at the drop of a hat. So especially if you're near um, large water bodies, just make sure you have uh, rain jackets or, you know, a, a sweater to bring with you. Um, it can go from very cloudy to bright and sunny in the matter, in a matter of minutes sometimes. So you want to make sure you have your environmental protection, like rain jackets and sunscreen, uh, sunglasses to protect your eyes. 
just anything you'd need not to get scorched by the sun or chilled by some water. Um, everyone has different traveling uh, experiences and needs, so I'm not I'm not the expert on what to bring when you come for a visit. Uh, but these are just general guidelines and things to consider when you do. Um, yeah, and yeah. I like to make a list before I leave and double check it to make sure I'm all packed because it it sucks when you forget something important at home, especially if you're, uh, you know, 1,300 kilometers away. Um, there's a few perks of visiting. Uh, well, there's many perks, but there's a few things that I want to mention at the end here. Um, the distinct northern landscapes and cultures um, are just fantastic. You know, you don't get tower and granite cliffs anywhere else in the province. Um, it's so remote and you're just removed from like the busy parts of, of city life and um, you just really can get some peace and solitude if that's what you're looking for. Uh, and there are exceptional opportunities to view wildlife. Uh, depending on the season as well, there are lots of community festivals that you can stop by and visit. Um, and these are both celebrating natural features or cultural history. Um, so, you know, Nipigon, which is just an hour north of Thunder Bay, has their annual Blueberry Fest in August. Um, and it's, it's a lovely time. Uh, this coming October will be the, I think the fifth or the sixth um, annual gathering of the Great Lakes Surfers. Uh, the festival is kind of, is called Wasashka. Um, and it's not a surfing competition. It's just, uh, it's a gathering. Um, I went last year for the first time. I don't surf. Uh, I just went to check it out. Um, it's held in Terrace Bay. Uh, and it, yeah, it just offers an excellent opportunity to see the power and the beauty of Lake Superior uh, and, um, you know, different recreational opportunities that people can do. It was, a, it was a lovely weekend, and I highly recommend it if you're traveling in the, in the fall time. Uh, and the Ontario Staycation Tax Credit, hopefully some folks have heard of this so far but it is a lovely incentive for people to do some traveling. Um, so if you do uh, stay in some accommodations, you wanna make sure to save your receipts because uh, if you travel this year, anytime, you know, in between uh, January, 2022 to December, uh, like the full year, uh, if you've traveled for recreation or leisure purposes, you could get up to 20% back um, your accommodation costs from this tax credit. And it's just as a measure to help encourage provincial, uh, the provincial economy and tourism that was hit so hard by the past couple of years of COVID, um, you know, different restrictions and just uncertainty of traveling. Um, yeah, so it's, there's a few different uh, ways to go about it. You can get 20% back of eligible accommodation costs up to $1,000 for an individual or $2,000 for a family. Uh, so the max money you'd be getting back if you submitted a hundred or $1,000 of uh, receipts, you could get $200 back or $400 if you were a family that spent up to $2,000. Um, campgrounds, cottage rentals, lodge stays, they all qualify. Um, if you're unsure, either ask the business or person um, who booked it for you, as they would have a better idea. Um, and I will also say I'm not an accountant. Uh, so if you uh, want more information on this, talk to an accountant or go on um, online and search up the stay staycation tax credit. It has all the rules and regulations. Um, but yeah, it's a good way for the government to help uh, promote uh, travel in the, in the province. Um, and I think that's it for me. Um, so we've got a little bit of time left here. If anyone has questions, comments, or queries. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jake. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we do have a couple questions, so I'm going to yes. read them to you. 
Um, there's somebody who's asking if there are charging stations for electric vehicles in parks or along their routes. Um, there are in some places. So in, in parks, uh, generally there aren't, uh, at least in provincial parks, there aren't uh, like superchargers or fast chargers like that. Um, but like when I worked as a gate attendant, we did have uh, folks driving electric cars like Teslas and Priuses. And uh, generally we um, allowed them to, if you just needed a quick charge, you know, sometimes people will let you plug into the, uh, the gatehouse like outlet essentially. Um, or if you're camping, you can plug into the, uh, yeah, if you're camping, you'd probably wanna get an electrical site uh, and then plug your car in that way. But in, in some of the communities, uh, there will be uh, fast charging stations. I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, with, with the growth of electric vehicles, more and more communities are looking to install them. So people definitely do travel across the province in Teslas and electric cars and stuff like that. So it's, it's very doable. Awesome, great to hear. Um, someone is also asking if Ontario Nature partners with Indigenous communities for tourism. Um, yes, we have done um, some of that work in the past. I believe a few years ago we had partnered with some communities um, to create like a pamphlet. It's kind of like a case study. Uh, I believe it was called Remoteness Cells, like tourism uh, in the north. Um, if I'm recalling that correctly, there was um, a lot of different players involved in that. Um, and yeah, I'm always looking uh, in my position as nature-based tourism coordinator, I'm always trying to find uh, new, new partners to work with and help their game and uh, yeah. Wonderful. Okay, uh, and how do you recommend taking camping or hiking gear on planes? For example, can people bring fuel for a camping stove? Um, yeah, so bringing that, you'd have to check with the airline. I know some things would be prohibited, especially if it's like a compressed gas or something. Um, you might have to check a bag. And I mean, if you're bringing like a big hiking pack, chances are you're, you're going to have to check it anyways. Um, but yeah, I think... I would double check with the airline on their list of prohibited um, substances because, you know, for international flights, sometimes all things are banned. But if you're just traveling within the province, there might be different uh, rules and regulations. Like uh, I, I haven't needed a passport to fly between right. Thunder Bay and Toronto. I just need a driver's license since I'm not traveling across any borders. Um, Let's so yeah, I would direct them to double check their carrier. That's that's a good Good point. Um, and do you know if there is train service to Thunder Bay from Toronto or elsewhere? Ooh, that's a touchy subject for Northerners. Um, so there used to be train service directly to Thunder Bay, like passenger uh, train, like via rail, I believe. Um, but I, maybe around a decade ago, they stopped that. Maybe it was in the 90s, I can't remember. Since I've been here, there's been no passenger train service directly to Thunder Bay. Um, it's two or three hours north, like the train station is in Armstrong, if you are riding on a passenger train. Um, and I don't think there would be any, um, like car rental spots. Armstrong is quite a small town. Like the, the train station is essentially just like a, a small concrete platform, uh, and a, and a little parking lot. So it's not very, uh, built up, but um, yeah, the answer is no, there's not really train service to Thunder Bay right now. All right. Um, and I know you touched a little bit on dogs and keeping them on, uh, on the leash, but mm -hmm. someone's asking if you know if dogs are welcome on the trails in general that you talked about. Yeah. Um, so, uh, at least in Ontario parks, dogs, uh, unless otherwise mentioned, um, dogs are pretty much welcome everywhere as long as they are under your control and on a leash that is no more than six feet long. Um, so some retractable leashes, you know, might uh, 
extend past that, but as long as you keep them shorter, it should be okay. Um, and yeah, dogs are welcome on trails as long as they're leashed and well behaved. Make sure you pick up after your pet as well. I will uh, mm -hmm. double down on that. Um, some other locations that I'll note, I'll mention about dogs in uh, you know natural spaces, at least for swimming beaches, and there will be signage on this, like at provincial parks. Um, they don't allow dogs on swimming beaches, but often they'll have uh, dog off leash areas. Um, sometimes they'll be fenced in at Mays Provincial Park that I mentioned. Um, they have an off leash dog area that's it's essentially like the far end of the beach. Um, it's not fenced in, so you need to make sure you, uh, if you are letting them off leash, that they can uh, recall to you when called um, and that they just stay under your control. But yeah they're usually more than welcome. Great, great news for pet lovers. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question. Um, Amari is saying, Thunder Bay sounds like a great place. For someone considering moving there, what are the employment opportunities and housing rental prices uh, in the area? Yeah, um, so there's, um, there's a pretty, uh, first of all, I agree. It's a lovely place. I moved here uh, never having been to the city in my life before. I like got dropped off on orientation day and I have not not moved since. I have no desire. It's, it's a beautiful place. Um, but yeah, for job opportunities, uh, it depends on uh, really what you like. There's a lot of resource-based um, stuff up here like forestry as well as uh, a bit further out of town there's like mining stuff that's not really I think what we're into is Ontario nature but um, but yeah there's also there's so much tourism opportunities um, whether you're working in parks or for businesses like being a guide um, yeah it's great and there's if like there's so many like restaurants and stuff like that that are popping up so if you're into cooking or hospitality stuff. Um, there are plenty of job opportunities in the area. As for um, like cost of living stuff, um, Northern Ontario is generally a little more expensive in terms of like fuel and food, um, just because it has to travel that much further from, you know, main hubs like Southern Ontario, Toronto. Uh, Thunder Bay I've found is okay since it is also a main hub elsewhere in the north. Um, but yeah, rent isn't super crazy. It's starting to creep up a bit as with everywhere, but um, I have a, I share with two roommates, uh, my house or two housemates. We all have our own room and we pay 1650 for like a really nice uh, like house in relatively downtown-ish, uh, like a five minute walk to downtown. So it's honestly, it's, it's doable. It's, it's nice. It's, uh, I definitely wouldn't be able to afford to live in Toronto or something like that. So I'm happy with being up here. Awesome. No, no shade to anyone down there, but. I think I'm going to move to Thunder Bay too, from Toronto. <laughs> I'll, sh I'll show you all around. <laughs> okay. That sounds great. Okay. It's almost 310. So I'm going to do two more questions and then we can wrap up. Yeah. Uh, so there's someone asking about Northern Lights and where mm. are good viewing locations? Yeah, so um, you can definitely see them up in Northern Ontario. Um, ideally, you'll want to be in a, uh, a relatively dark spot. Um, so provincial parks are usually a good spot for that or just more remote places. Um, that being said, ironically enough, the only two times that I've seen the Northern Lights have been in Thunder Bay. Um, in my second year of university, I was on campus and I looked up uh, from coming out of the gym and there was just like, you know, dancing green lights in the sky. And then I think a year ago, there was a bunch of red lights that were happening over the city. Um, but yeah, there are some Northern Lights, uh, like tracking websites or apps um, that kind of let you know when um, the solar activity that causes them are going to happen. So if, if that is something you're looking forward to, uh, that might be a good resource to look into. Cool. That's great. Um, thank you. Okay, I guess one more question. Last question. Um, we have a question on accessibility. So Janet mm -hmm. is saying, 
I am 70 years old and require a walker to get around. Are there any accessible trails? Um, yes, but not as many as I think we should have. Um, so like we met Canyon, um, it is two kilometers. I'm not sure like the distances you can go, um, but as far as just trail design, it is like uh, flat and wide and there's not like any roots or anything in the way. So that uh, might be a, an option for you, um, as well as uh, Kakabeka Falls. Um, they have uh, the boardwalks along. If you are um, using a wheelchair or have a walker or something like that, um, some of the conservation areas closer to Thunder Bay uh, might be better because they'll have proper like paved walking trails through their spot um, as well as interpretive signs. Um, but up here, at least from the trails and provincial parks I've been to, there's not, uh, not too many that are uh, super accessible. Sometimes there will be um, like ramps down onto beaches and stuff, but uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, well, it's already 3.12. I think it's time to wrap up. Um, we know there were other questions that we couldn't cover, but if you want to contact Jake, uh, Jake, maybe if you want to pop your email on the chat. Um, yeah. Yeah, a good idea. Also, somebody was asking about where can they learn more about this work. I'm also going to share a link on the chat about um, that talks about the projects that we have going on in the Boreal region where you can learn more. Um, and yes, we will be sending our recording of the webinar uh, sometime next week. And thank you again, Jake, for a wonderful presentation and everybody for joining. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, thank you all.